So um, please join me now in prayer before we share the word of God. Father, I thank you for how you're working on our hearts today, Lord. You, you, we, we are so grateful, Father God, that you give us the chance to have song and be able to sing and come forth and get on our knees and praise and cry and thank you and, and admit things. We thank you, Lord, that we're here to have another chance. So, Father, as we go forth now, we ask for this ground to be fertile so that your word will be planted and that you'll make it grow. We thank you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, <clears throat> I think many of you know that we're living in a time where uh, everyone seems to be a little bit more sensitive than they were, let's say, a generation or two ago. It's, it seems, and I don't think it seems, I think it's a reality, that many people are offended by any perceived slight. We, we have, if you will, these politically correct police that seem to be patrolling the airwaves or out in the culture and writing articles or, you know, on TV, radio. It seems like there are certain buzzwords that if these certain buzzwords are said, there's like a, like a penalty flag, like a referee in a football game. They'll throw a penalty flag on you and then you're labeled, uh, penalized as being a bigot or a sexist or extremist or other labels. Now, I kind of categorize this, and I talk about this quite frequently if you've been coming here the last decade. Freedom of speech is under attack, especially religious speech, okay? Which is often tagged now as hate speech by people who just reject biblical truth. Now, the title today, I, I came up with Mr. Feelgood. So, the Apostle Paul warned young Pastor Timothy. Now, Paul wrote this. This was considered his last letter. He, he wrote all these letters we read in the Bible uh, Paul, that Paul wrote, and most of them were written while he was in prison in different times. He was in prison multiple times. And this is considered his last letter before he was executed by Nero. And... He's writing this to young Pastor Timothy. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. I read from the New King James Version. Follow along. He says, Timothy, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Now, I want to look at some things that Jesus did, the way Jesus spoke and some of the examples. And contrary to some opinions, Jesus wasn't always a Mr. Nice Guy who never offended anyone with his words or would avoid, you know, carefully avoid controversy. Some of us have this misguided notion that Jesus was a feel-good preacher who was always sweet, kind, diplomatic, and never made waves or rocked the boat. Now, if that's how you perceive this, I got to ask you, are you kidding me? What Bible are you reading? That's one of the things. If your Bible has Jesus described that way, I would ask that you use that to start your next fire. Because that is not the Word of God. See, here's the deal. Jesus offended many people with the unvarnished truth that made them feel very uncomfortable. For instance... He's talking, in, and it's recorded for us in John chapter 6, starting with verse 60. And the Word of God says, On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Now, what did he just talk about? Jesus had just talked about how they're going to have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. He's saying, I'm the true manna from heaven. You knew about your forefathers who received manna all those years. I'm, I'm here now in the flesh, and you're going to have to eat of me. So it, the word says, aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus says to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. 
The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. Sometimes, folks, what this is saying is the truth hurts. It hits us right between the eyes and it cuts like a knife. Jesus didn't preach what I would refer to as cotton candy sermons that seem to be in vogue today. You know, cotton candy sermons with the fluffy strings of sugar-coated thoughts woven together to make people feel good, but containing little spiritual nutrition. It's just like junk food, right? Oh yeah, junk food can fill us up, but it's a waste and it has no nutritional value. Now, I'm not suggesting that Jesus intentionally went all, all about to offend people, but the, but the truth is what he spoke, right? And, and he had a way of separating the wheat from the chaff, the sheep from the goats, if you will. And to be clear, Jesus was loving and graceful and compassionate and tender-hearted toward the outcast and the downtrodden of society. In fact, he went out of his way to visit where others refused to go. For instance, most of the Jews, due to prejudice and bigotry, traveled around Samaria. Jesus, on the other hand, deliberately went through Samaria and broke down cultural barriers and prejudices by even speaking to a woman at a well. Some things Jesus did were considered scandalous in his culture. For instance, Jesus touched and healed lepers. He befriended tax collectors and sinners. He even allowed a sinful woman to anoint and touch him and pour oil over him. And Jesus healed on the Sabbath day, just to mention a few of the obvious examples. Jesus worked outside the lines of social norms for a Jewish man, especially a rabbi. Even his own cousin, John the Baptist, didn't fully understand him. Remember now that John the Baptist sent messengers to Jesus asking him, are, are you the one we have been waiting for, or do we look for another one? Now Jesus responds to him by telling you know, how people were being healed and receiving the gospel. But then Jesus adds this tagline to his response to John. He goes, Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Well, apparently John was offended by Jesus. And why, why would that be? Well, John was suffering in prison while Jesus was socializing at dinner parties with sinners. Just put yourself in that situation and see how you would act. Right? Jesus' styles and methods didn't fit the mold of what John had expected in a Messiah. And sadly, but truthfully, that is why I don't think Jesus would be welcome in many of a church today. Jesus challenged the status quo. He ruffled feathers. He made enemies, and he attacked the religious establishment. Jesus showed compassion to sinners, but he also confronted their sin. He was very critical of corrupt leadership and even called people some unflattering names. He called Herod Antipas a fox because he killed his brother Philip and stole his brother's wife Herodias. See, foxes are predators who prey on weaker animals. So Jesus was simply calling Herod out on his abuse of power. Well, Jesus didn't stop there. He called uh, two of his disciples, James and John, sons of thunder. Now, that wasn't a compliment. But it was a dig at their loudmouth, childlike, hot-headed, quick-tempered, prejudiced ways. He called Peter Satan for trying to interfere with God's plan for him to go to the cross. He called Judas Iscariot evil, the son of perdition, for his treachery. He called his own disciples doubters with little faith when he calmed a storm. Jesus called them faithless and, perver and a perverse generation when they failed to cast out a demon. He called them fools and slow of heart to believe when they doubted his resurrection. But, if, but his, you know, if that's not harsh enough, Jesus reserved his strongest verbal barbs for the self-righteous religious leaders. He called them blind, blind guides, serpents, generation of vipers, fools, and hypocrites. Jesus' blunt words didn't always make his hearers feel warm and fuzzy, but as the old saying goes, if the shoe fits, wear it. You know, folks, the truth is like medicine. It doesn't always taste good initially, but it will help you eventually. See, Jesus' strange sayings are sometimes hard to swallow, but they are words of life and salvation. 
Any skilled surgeon will hurt us first in the process of healing us. Jesus' sermons, the word of God, was just like that of a surgery. Short-term pain in exchange for long-term gain. He performed spiritual surgery on people's hearts with the sharp scalpel of his words. Some thought that Jesus was mean when he put out the mocking mourners before he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Remember that scene? I mean, he's asked by this man to come. On the way he goes there, that's when the woman who had been bleeding sees him and draws off of him and is healed, and he keeps going. And then, yeah, I think it's in the book of Mark, it's described, because it's talked about in a few of the Gospels, but I think in the book of Mark, it's explained that Jairus' uh, people from his home come and go, ah, oh, forget it, you don't need to bring this healer guy, because... Your daughter's dead. Jesus shows up and there's all this m very loud wailing going on. And he, and, and he says, stop it. She's not dead. She's just sleeping. And he has them all leave. Now, just think about that. You bring a guy into your home you don't know that you think your dad thinks maybe can heal. And you're all wailing and mourning over them. And he says, get out of here right now. I got work to do. How would that make you feel? But that's what the Bible says Jesus did. Right? Others thought that he was too uh, extreme when he, when he made a whip and drove the greedy money changers out of the temple. Remember now, Jesus is both the lion and the lamb, the perfect balance of the tough and tender sides of love. See, we are living in an age when, when a lot of preachers often walk on eggshells to avoid saying anything negative or offensive. The good shepherd feeds his sheep what they need to hear, not just what they want to hear. In other words, folks, the gospel of Jesus Christ does not care one bit about being tolerant. The gospel of Jesus Christ cares about truth. The Bible says there is nothing new under the sun. Indeed, by today's secular progressive standards, what should concern us more is the standard of lukewarm Christians and lukewarm ministries. It makes me think of an iceberg thawing out. What I mean is, when you see these, you know, you're watching on a, unless you've seen it in person, but I'm usually watching when I see it on like history or National Geographic, you see these pictures in the Arctic of these huge icebergs and then chunk, big chunks fall off of ice. And it's like that intense pressure of postmodern paganism forcing parts of what Jesus taught to break away from the truth. As this huge piece of ice falls off the iceberg, it's like that, that's what would slander Jesus himself as an intolerant bigot. They're basically crucifying Jesus all over again. My whole point, my whole contention is under the ten contemporary misconception of tolerance, Christ was and is intolerant indeed. Rather than, you know, people today would rather have you know, rather than admonishing the adulterous woman, go now and leave your life of sin. Christians today, it's like the yeast is leaven right there, right? They demand at once that our never-changing Lord change the unchangeable. It's if they want Jesus to say, oh, go now and continue in your life of sin. That's not what he said. He looked at her and said, who condemns you? Where are your condemners? None of them are here. Well, I don't condemn you. Follow me and sin no more. That's what Jesus said. He didn't say, stay the way you are. He said, follow me and you'll change. Right? See, that's not the grace of God that a lot of people are saying where you can stay in a lifestyle that's not right. It's cheap grace and it's an apostasy. While it's true that none of us is without sin, in other words, let's be the first to drop our stone. We are nonetheless commanded to repent of our sins. Jesus says, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. This is from Luke. Well, he said that after they came to him to say, hey, Herod's got these people and they're, they've got all this blood. They're mixing of blood and they're very sinful people. And then there's this uh, big tower in Siloam. Whose sin caused these people to do this? And Jesus goes, you're missing the point. The point is, look at your own heart. Unless you repent, you will likewise perish. 
So the first step to repentance is recognizing sin for what it is and rejecting deceptive attempts to sanitize it by calling it something else. What are those things today that we hear calling sin something else? Oh, that's my choice. That's my sexual orientation. She's not my wife. We're just soulmates. Come on. See, Scripture is true. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Indeed, far too many seeker-friendly and mainline Christian denominations are doing that and have been doing that for the last 20 to 30 years. And I can say that. You know how I can say that? Because many of you have come from those kind of ministries where they just can't find it in them themselves to care front people on what Scripture calls sin. They call evil good. They intentionally omit the central repent and go and sin no more for instruction from Jesus. Right? That's elements of the good news, folks. That is part of the good news. You know why they do that? For fear of driving away would-be fish in the net. You know, those little slippery little buggers who prefer whirling around in the toxic sea of temptation rather than surrendering under the ultimate fisher of men. Look at what Paul tells the church in Galatia. Here's Galatians chapter 1. Now he writes in this letter after he heard about this because he's helped start the church and he went away and he heard, some, he heard a report. So he writes this letter and here's what he's saying to them. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are, thriving, are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. Seems that is much like today's nicer than Jesus said. These Galatians maybe for different reasons than today, adopted a false gospel that in their eyes made them more relevant and palatable to the world around them. Does that sound familiar? Oh, it's quiet in here today. I must be really zinging a chord. For sure, those words in Scripture are not very tolerant, but they are filled with grace, tempered with truth nonetheless. Paul continued, Galatians 1 verse 9, as we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. And so according to Paul, those who shrink from the full counsel of God are not only out of line, they are under God's curse. And it's painfully obvious that, just like the Galatians, far too many in today's churches are more concerned with not offending others, most especially those who are without Christ. And rather than being fearless servants of Christ, instead they have busied themselves with trying to please people and be tolerant of all the desires of all the people. And like the Galatians, they have created a false gospel to that end. Pleasing the world is not taking up your cross and suffering for Christ, people. Pleasing the world is a cakewalk. John 15, verse 19. Jesus here again. Listen to what he says. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. So here we go again with the question. Does the world hate you? Because it should. There's where the rubber meets the road. If you're preaching a gospel that they don't hate, then you're not preaching the gospel. Now, here's where I can use what Galatians just said. I'm not talking, I'm not trying to please you. I'm trying to please God. Again, trying to do this again today. You can't belong to the world and to Christ. You must choose. And what happens during this choosing phase is way too many want a user-friendly God, if you will, whom, whom we can kind of adapt to our chosen lifestyles. In other words, we kind of want religion a la carte. We stroll up to some celestial salad bar and pick and choose the attributes of God that appeal to us and throw the others aside. We are attracted to the qualities of God, such as love and forgiveness and compassion and the promise of heaven, but we recoil from such concepts as a God of holiness who loves us yet requires repentance. In Jesus' day, 
that is exactly how the people were. They wanted a deliverer. They wanted the Messiah to conform to their plans instead of God's. They wanted Jesus to destroy Rome, but not the cherished sins of their hypocritical, superficial religion. And reality is, most of us are exactly like that today. We will sing the praises of Jesus who will give us unlimited health, wealth, success, and happiness, but they recoil from a Jesus who requires obedience and commitment. Look at the multitude, right, you know, that watched Jesus ride into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. They would pro loudly proclaim Jesus as long as they believe Jesus will satisfy their selfish desires. So what is really going on here is we are remaking Jesus in our own image. They have a Jesus they can be comfortable with. Luke's Gospels adds this detail regarding Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now, this would be Palm Sunday, the week before he's crucified. Luke chapter 19, verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem, this is Jesus. As Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. Now, what a strange contrast on this day of great joy and excitement. The Greek word used here for wept is kalo. And it means a strong, signifying bitter anguish, wailing aloud as though one were mourning the dead. In other words, it was an audible, loud weeping, bawling. Okay? Now, there's another word that's used in the Bible in the Greek to describe uh, wept. And it describes you cry silently. So, in other words, Jesus was crying very audibly. A lot of people could see it. So why was Jesus wailing out so? Jesus knew that by and large, he had been rejected. He, here, here he had been three and a half years. Healing the sick, raising the dead, feeding the hungry, forgiving their sins. Yet they may, remained mostly distant from him. He remained alone and rejected. Isaiah 53 said this is exactly what would happen. The Messiah would be despised and rejected among men. We are told in John's gospel that he came to his own and his own did not receive him. So this broke Jesus' heart. Here was Jesus with his own creation turning their backs on him. Now, in other gospels, we get some additional things going on at this time. A couple of the other Gospels say Jesus comes into the temple, looks around, assesses the situation, departs, goes to Bethany for the night to spend the night with some friends and, you know, the disciples likely. And then the following morning when Jesus returns, he took action and cleansed the temple. This was righteous indignation. He came back and did a little house cleaning, if you will. He drove out the money changers in the temple and overturned their tables. And this is what he said, it is written. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. That's a pretty radical thing Jesus did. I don't think he was very tolerant, do you? Right? And you've got to grasp this. These were not like portable little card tables that they had set up. By all accounts, these were probably massive marble tables in keeping with the decor of the temple. Jesus was brandishing a whip picking up marble tables and pushing them over, sending these people running. Why, why this indignation from Jesus? Well, the money changers working for the Pharisees and the Sadducees had inflated the prices and were ripping the people off that were coming for Passover because they had to get their spotless lambs. It's a big racket. It was a scam. And they were taking advantage of these people who wanted to worship the Lord. See, if the Messiah was supposed to be a military leader, which is what the people wanted. They wanted him like David, like King David. He would have brought an army into Jerusalem, and he would have attacked the Roman garrison. But that's not where Jesus went, folks. Here's what you got to grasp. He went to the temple. He went to God's house. He didn't go after the pagans of Rome. He went after his own people who had gone astray and were misleading others. The supreme issue for the Lord was not Rome's army. The supreme issue is God's people. It was his house where the cleaning would begin. Jesus recognized that as long as things were wrong with Israel's worship, they could never have their nation right. 
The Bible says that judgment begins at the house of God. Scripture also tells us that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I think this speaks to us in that we sometimes spend too much time and attention trying to bring about governmental change. We believe this will help our culture and our society. And in a sense, it will. But in another sense, it will not. I'm going to ask the band to come back up here. I want you to listen to what I'm saying here. It's my firm conviction that every Christian should register to vote and should vote for candidates that best represent scriptural beliefs. All right? We need to do what we can, in other words. But here's what I hear. People will say the problem is the government, or the problem is the president, or the problem is the Congress. But God says the problem is his people. That's what God says. God wants his family cleaned up first. Notice that Jesus didn't say the problem was with the Roman authorities. He didn't say the problem was with those in the Roman Senate. He didn't say the problem was the economy of the time. The fact of the matter is that Jesus concentrated his energies on his people because he cares. Here's what God said as he was assessing a culture and gave his prescription for revival. This is what God says. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Notice where God points his finger. If my people, he points it at us. Don't look at somebody else. Don't look at that comedian. Look at your own heart. Listen to what God says. He's looking at us. He says, get your house clean first. See, people say the government should do this or should do that. God is saying, in effect, make sure you are living a godly life. Make sure you have turned away from sin. That's where revival will begin. The true change in America, in our conscience, in our soul, will come from an individual spiritual awakening. That's what we need to grasp, folks. I know so many times, you know, we'll say, well, this is messed up and that's messed up. Hey, I'm right there with you, but you know what? When we're doing that, we better make sure we're looking at our own heart first. It's the same thing when you see your brother doing something, your sister doing something, this couple doing something, this family doing something, that state doing something, that city doing something. How are you doing? How are you doing? God's here. He wants to cleanse us all. If you're here and you know Jesus, then you do what's called repentance. If you're here and you've never received Jesus, you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, and then you learn this trait of admitting when you're wrong. It's just the word the, word the Bible uses is sin. It means it misses the mark that God set for us. There's not a person looking at me or me looking at you that doesn't make mistakes. Already have today. That's how grace-filled he is because we're still here. We get a chance to get it right and come to him. And how we get it right is not by covering it up, but we admit it. You just admit it. You just thank him. And you go, Lord, I'm so sorry. We partake in communion. This is what he was talking about. Wow, this is a hard teaching. Well, now you got to go eat my flesh and drink my blood. That's what communion is. It's representing him. It's a symbol of what he did for you. Do this in remembrance of him. Folks, he's got it set up so that all we have to do is admit our mistakes and stay humble, and it's all going to be fine. It's all going to be fine. The altar team will be up here. Folks, don't miss an opportunity today to admit some things, to partake in communion, to receive Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior forever. Please join me as we continue praising and worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.